As a Star Wars fan, life changed for me between Episode 1 in 1999 to Attack of the Clones in 2002. I now lived in Nashville and had my own business that I shared with a partner in 2000 called Scene 70, and it was full of Star Wars merchandise. I even hired some actors to come down for a toy show to do autographs. I collected Star Wars like mad, and I never missed the new stuff. At the time, Hasbro had just released some of the best figures to date with the Power of the Jedi line. Back then, Hasbro was making figures fans craved for years. They didn't limp along with rehashes and re-sculpts. Instead, figures were creative and plentiful. They also wanted to make new vehicles and didn't make shallow excuses. And their distribution was more trusted then. A lot of EU material was also released during this time, and it was really a great time to be a fan. When I wasn't collecting, I was watching every new release in theaters, as I wrote for the Westview newspaper in Nashville as a movie critic, while my wonderful niece would usually trail along. Look at her. Boy, I miss those days. When I decided to step away from owning my own business, I returned to my love of running video stores. This time it was Hollywood Video in Franklin. On my free time, I would meet up with friends and we would discuss the upcoming film. Yes, that's me. You know, the one in the Emperor's Royal Guard outfit. My circle of friends were really enthusiastic about The Phantom Menace and the upcoming prequels. We all knew about the hate for Jar Jar, and the media didn't miss a chance to pounce on Lucas for supposedly dropping the ball. If you watched our Phantom Menace video, then you know I disagreed with that assessment completely. It was well known that Lucas altered his plans for some prequel elements due to the backlash, and this really worried me because I thought Episode 1 was a great film, and it was up to the high standard I expected from Lucasfilm. I just wanted the next film to at least match the quality and depth of Episode 1. I personally did not want Lucas to dumb down the next film because The Phantom Menace was very intelligent. On April 23, 2002, the new Saga line of figures were released for the upcoming film. I arranged with the local Walmart to cover their midnight event for the newspaper and here is that article. There was still lots of traffic. But the energy of fans seemed muted. Figures were also very odd. They were more statue than figure. Then there was cinema trends themselves. Since 1977, Star Wars blew everyone away with visual effects. No one competed with Star Wars for kids' attention or nerd attention. But now, there was a lot of media giving Star Wars a run for its money. The Lord of the Rings, released in December 2001, was the new nerd focus, and its quality was amazing. The new kid craze was Harry Potter, and books were a big deal at the time. The Goblet of Fire was going to be out in July, and the sequel to The Sorcerer's Stone, The Chamber of Secrets, was coming out this Christmas. And there was Harry Potter product everywhere. Also... Two weeks before Star Wars came out, a new Spider-Man movie was released quite confidently. Normally, big films gave a wide berth to Star Wars, but it seemed Star Wars was vulnerable for some reason. Whenever Star Wars films were released in the past, they were always number one for the year in box office receipts. Not in 2002. Spider-Man crushed it with 403.7 million domestically to gain the title. Then there was The Two Towers, which took 342.9 million. Then there was Attack of the Clones, in a shocking third place, with 310.6 million. It would be Spider-Man breaking house records that year as well, with a 112 million weekend opening compared to Episode 2's 80 million. After Spider-Man's opening, comic fans were going nuts, and Episode 2's release seemed slightly diminished. So at midnight on May 16, 2002, I took some friends in my press pass to cover the event with my spouse. The crowds were not that enthusiastic as Episode 1, but there was excitement in the air nonetheless. I sat with bated breath. 
I will admit I was nervous over the possible changes that were coming for the prequels and admittedly my innocent outlook towards Star Wars was diminished because I was involved and active with consuming media news on entertainment. During 2002, Star Wars was turning a little negative when looking at entertainment magazines, interviews, and media reporting. It was important to understand during 2002, the media was not so focused on negativity like today. Back then, media celebrated film's escapism and generally kept real-world issues from infiltrating the medium. News mostly celebrated stars or the films. Talent was more disciplined about revealing their political leanings and exposing their personal agendas. This created a myth around the talent behind films and made them more appealing. Not all talent could do this, and those that didn't were usually less popular or disliked by mass audiences. Today, unfortunately, this is an epidemic that infests Hollywood. Uh, I ha went to Indiana Jones and Jaws and every movie that Steven Spielberg's ever made, and by the way, he's never made a movie with a female lead. Sorry, Steven. I don't mean to call your ass out, but it's true. I remember when I was doing Hunger Games, nobody had ever put a woman in the lead of an action movie yeah. because it wouldn't work. It, we were told. Anyways, around 2002, it was clear something was different about prequel coverage, and a perfect example of this was Entertainment Weekly's articles on Attack of the Clones. It was as if the angry reactions was what the movies were really about rather than the material itself. Stunningly, Entertainment Weekly asked why couldn't Episode 2 have been Episode 1 as if the first film was pointless. Then, immediately after that question, it went on to cover the Jar Jar backlash and how Ahmed Best lost the favorite sidekick character of 1999 to Mini-Me from Austin Powers the spy who shagged me. Then it went on to note how fans hated elements of episode one from Anakin to the Trade Federation and yes, Jar Jar. They approached episode two as if it was an apology for episode one. Then the article positioned Lucas to defend his stance on episode one and he did. He also defended the argument that the acting was flat and that he focused on kids enjoyment rather than 20-something year olds and up, which most likely infuriated the elder groups. Then, as if it was not enough barbs were thrown at the previous movie, Entertainment Weekly brought up racism in the characters of Episode 1, and Ahmed Best was quoted as saying, There was absolutely no intention of the character being perceived that way. In the end, more than two-thirds of the coverage was Phantom Menace hate, rather than coverage of the new film. This was prevalent in many articles at the time. And it was no surprise that the review mimicked the narration of the main article. When Lisa Schwarzbaum of Entertainment Weekly reviewed the film, she reported, Repeated the marching narrative that The Phantom Menace was an off-key story of trade wars, distracting appearances by a kid actor, and I quote, a computer-drawn horror known as Jar Jar Binks. They used these words as if it was a mantra to goose-step to, and it did not match my lexicon one bit. Had it not been for my friends who loved Phantom Menace, I might have felt like an oddball because the narrative against the prequels was metastasizing. Little did I know that Attack of the Clones would cement it, and the hate would only grow. Star Wars Episode Two is basically as bad as The Phantom Menace. I tried pretty hard to figure out which one of these movies is worse, and I'm having a really hard time figuring that out right now. But I think if you held a gun up to my head and made me answer, I'd probably say that this one is marginally better. Why is it so bad, you ask? 
Well, it'll take a little while to explain because basically the answer involves every single thing in the film, except for Natalie Portman's midriff. And that lady. But what I can say for sure is that every one of you out there at one point before watching this movie said to yourself, Well, The Phantom Menace was awful, but maybe this one will be better. Okay, let's start with the basic arguments first. So Attack of the Clones takes place 10 years after The Phantom Menace, and right there, I always thought, when I saw this movie at first, I was like, why did you need The Phantom Menace? Ultimately, Anakin's grown up now, he's a new character, his relationship with Padme, he doesn't have it. Everyone's just kind of in a different place 10 years later, so why even have The Phantom Menace? I would've been fine, this whole prequel saga just started out here, it's like, oh, Anakin, he's an apprentice. He's a Jedi, we can just hear at one point, it's like, oh yeah, when I found you on the farm, all right, let's go do some shit. And that'd be that, you don't need The Phantom Menace, so why have The Phantom Menace? If you watch the episodes on Phantom Menace that we covered earlier, you know the answer to this question. If you don't, I highly advise you go back to those before watching this movie, especially if you share the sentiments Jeremy Johns puts forth here. Episode 1 is the foundation of the prequels, and it is so important to understanding the galaxy, and especially the Jedi. The Jedi are a serious problem in Episode 1 and 2, and they are just as responsible for creating the Empire due to their apathy and pride as the Senate. More so, seeing Anakin as a pure idealistic and selfless boy is paramount to the tragedy of Darth Vader. His attachment to his mother is also an issue to having him turn to the dark side, because he never trained with Yoda when he was young. It wasn't just Palpatine that corrupted this child, it was the Jedi too. You would have none of this insight without The Phantom Menace as it was perfectly set up in that film. A lot of folks complain that Anakin and Padme have too much of an age difference and I completely ignore this argument because I know tons of 30 plus people, both men and women, who are with people that are five years their junior. Some argue that Portman did not age a day while Anakin aged drastically, and it is not believable. This is ridiculous because a nine-year-old looks nothing like they appear when they are 18 or 19. Let's take a look at Portman from age 21 in 2002 to age 27 in 2008. As you can see, she looked the same age for some time, and therefore it's totally believable how both appeared on screen during Attack of the Clones. Before we start the film, I want to get straight to the point. I do not hate Attack of the Clones, but I was disappointed how disjointed the film was as it went on. I intend to cover this film in a linear fashion, and I will say for the first part of the film, I was there. It continued a lot of what Episode 1 set up, what with the outlook of the Jedi, the politics, and Obi-Wan's nature. I hope this does not disappoint those that expected a love letter to Episode 2, considering my praise of Episode 1 was profound, but I'm no good to anyone being dishonest about what I think. So when the crawl starts for the film, we learn that thousands of systems were leaving the Republic, which makes sense because that's what Episode 1 sets up. We later learn of some of the groups that leave the Senate, which include the Trade Federation, the Banking Clan, the Corporate Alliance, the Techno-Union Army, and the Commerce Guild, to name a few. All of these organizations have to do with money or military. Seeing how things did not turn out to benefit them in Phantom Menace, it makes sense they would leave the Republic. Also, to make a large army and to run a separate government to challenge the Republic, you would need a lot of money. It would have been nice that a lot of these details were explored in the film, like was Palpatine cracking down on corruption, or laws making it hard for them to make profits? We don't know, and... There are many situations in this movie that don't answer questions. We also learn that the Republic must be threatened by this group because they are voting to make an army, and it also states that the Jedi are being overwhelmed. How are the Jedi being overwhelmed? This is never clearly stated. I can accept that they are being overwhelmed, but this is the beginning of a lot of unanswered questions in this movie, and they really add up later on. This will be covered later, though. After the attempt on Padme's life, we come to our first deleted scene for the movie. 
This deleted scene has Padme pleading to the Senate to not vote for an army as someone would kill her in an attempt to foster its passage. She states that if they make an army, the Separatists would arm as well and that would be it for peace. Little does Padme know that the Separatists are currently arming to overwhelm the Republic to force terms. We shall have an army greater than any in the galaxy. The Jedi will be overwhelmed. The Republic will agree to any demands we make. I like the idea that Padme is wrong here as it shows she is not perfect, but I also like the scene because she sticks to her principles like always. Next to Qui-Gon, Padme was my favorite character from episode 1 and 2, and I have mixed feelings on whether this scene should have been included. Let us know in the comments what you think about this scene. Amidala assumes that Dooku is behind her assassination temp, and she is partly right. However, the Jedi show their ignorance, vouching for their fellow Jedi politically. He is a political idealist, not a murderer. You know, my lady, Count Dooku was once a Jedi. He couldn't assassinate anyone. It's not in his character. I simply adore her stare at Mace. I always interpreted this as her seeing Mace as deluded, which he is. The trend from episode one continues, and the setup of that film is so important. The Jedi are literally blind to many issues in the galaxy, and they work through things in a political nature. By the end of the film, they will pay for it. So I were given 60 seconds in an elevator to establish that Obi-Wan and Anakin are friends. And please notice how this is not accomplished by how they act as friends, but rather it's by them recounting things that happened in the past, things we never see. Something about falling into a nest of Gundarks. I've this tent since, since we fell into that nest of Gundarks. Now this may seem trivial, but it establishes an important precedence in the way these films are written. We don't see or feel characters or connections with each other. We have to be told about them. To be honest, I didn't expect Obi-Wan and Anakin to be close, despite Ben saying... And he was a good friend. I say this because in episode 1, Obi-Wan tolerated Anakin and even spoke about him in earshot. By the end of the film, when he said he would train Anakin, there was no enthusiasm or excitement in the boy. He was more pensive than anything. Now, ten years have passed, and a lot can change in that time. But if you go by what this movie shows us, Obi-Wan does nothing but try to control or chastise Anakin throughout the film. There is no close trusting bond here. Even though Anakin looks upon Obi-Wan like a father, there is still a tense and unhealthy relationship. Even in the elevator scene, Obi-Wan forces out a fake chuckle after talking about the Gundark nest. Their relationship is completely forced and civil. I simply don't believe that there is a good relationship here, maybe after years fighting in the Clone Wars, but certainly not now. So let's explore this relationship from what the first two prequels directly shows us, starting with Anakin. Right up front, Anakin lived ten years with his mother. He was indispensable for Watto as he was a good mechanic and useful at the shop. He was completely selfless, as stated by Qui-Gon. He gives without any thought of reward. Well, he knows nothing of greed. To add to that point, he gave much of his winnings to Jira in a deleted scene. He risked his life and gave his secret pod racer, which has value, to strangers to help them. He acted on instinct and trusted himself, and he was appreciated for it. Now, we don't see Obi-Wan's youth in the films, and although I know what the EU states, I'm not going to put it forth in this video, even though it would only strengthen my argument. Needless to say, Obi-Wan is a child of the Jedi. He was one of the younglings trained by Yoda, and he is fully indoctrinated to the Jedi. If you have seen my videos on the Phantom Menace, then you know Obi-Wan uses his devotion to challenge Qui-Gon throughout the first film. Obi-Wan is completely loyal to the Jedi way to a fault. He can be without compassion, stubborn, and insensitive and he can justify it by using the Jedi Code. The key to understanding Anakin and Obi-Wan's relationship is Qui-Gon. 
So I always find it ridiculous when someone says episode one was pointless. They just don't understand the movie at all. When Qui-Gon took Anakin under his wing, he believed in him and took responsibility for him via desire. He understood Anakin's need for a father figure, and he was up to the task because unlike the Jedi, he valued compassion and was not apathetic. There is a reason why the fight with Darth Maul was called the Duel of the Fates. Because the outcome of that fight was the fate of Anakin Skywalker. When Qui-Gon died, there was no one that could understand what Anakin needs in his training. And that was what created Darth Vader. When Qui-Gon died, Anakin lost any chance of finding acceptance and warmth because the Jedi were cold and lifeless. Obi-Wan was a part of this and took on Anakin because of a promise, not a desire. Because Obi-Wan was young, he did not have the presence and experience of Qui-Gon, and therefore he was not a father figure. Rather, he was a brother to Anakin. Anakin did not need a brother. He needed a guiding hand and a father figure. Because of what I just told you, at the start of Attack of the Clones, it is very quickly established that Anakin has relationship issues. He is always trying to prove himself, and he is desperate for connection and warmth. Just look how fast he starts opening up to Jar Jar, who he has not seen for ten years. I've thought about her every day since we parted, and she's forgotten me completely. Then there his emotional honesty towards Padme, which is very jarring and uncomfortable, not just for Padme, but the audience as well. He's overly critical. He never listens. He, he doesn't understand. It's not fair. He is starving and desperate. It is so blatant. Once again, the director and actor specifically chose to do this performance this way, and it is for a reason. We can say that Lucas is terrible with actors, but that is an assumption. To dismiss what is on the screen is to dismiss what is really going on. To add to this, for years Anakin kept his infatuation for Padme and his feelings for his mother alive by fantasizing about them. I've thought about her every day since we parted him. This only enhances his desire for a connection between those two individuals. Obi-Wan is sincerely trying to impart the Jedi way to Anakin because he believes heart and soul in the Jedi way. This is a tough chore because of Anakin's desire for connection. The Jedi do not allow this. Now Obi-Wan is not a bad person, even though Episode 1 and 2 portray him in sort of a bad light. He is just dispassionate and focused like the rest of the Jedi. Obi-Wan lives through the Jedi Code and finds meaning in that. Anakin finds meaning in pleasing those he is connected to and acts on instinct. Due to this, Obi-Wan constantly tries to control Anakin by dismissing his instinct and nature. Let's go through examples in Attack of the Clones. In their first meeting with Padme, Anakin wants to protect Padme and find her killer instinctually. He cares for her and wants to go all out to keep her safe. Obi-Wan might care, as we really don't know, but he will not go outside what the Council says. He will do things exactly by the code. He has no qualms about emasculating Anakin in front of others to express this. We will not exceed our mandate, my young Padawan learner. I meant it in the interest of protecting her, Master, of course. We will not go through this exercise again, Anakin, and you will pay attention to my lead. To be fair to Obi-Wan, Anakin is a bit impetuous here, but Obi-Wan's reaction is quite harsh. We will do exactly as the Council has instructed, and you will learn your place, young one. Ironically, the Council later agrees with Anakin's foresight by ordering an investigation, the very thing Anakin suggested in the first place. Don't worry. Now that the Council has ordered an investigation, it won't take Master Obi-Wan long to find this bounty hunter. Then, this happens. I can sense everything going on in that room. Trust me. It's too risky. Besides, your senses aren't that attuned, my young apprentice. 
I think he's a good man. My, I sense it too. Here is yet another example. This is a shortcut, I think. Well, you've lost it. I'm deeply sorry, Master. That was some shortcut, Anakin. He went completely the other way. Once again, you've proved if you'll excuse me. Then there is this nugget. She went into the club, Master. Patience. Use the Force. Think. There are a ton of criticisms that Obi-Wan throw at Anakin throughout the film, and the truth is, a whole video can be made on this topic, so I don't want to spend a time on every single clip. As we go on, I will point them out. But I guess the point is, is that Anakin is naturally attuned to the Force, and things seem to come easier for him. This serves his instincts very well, and unfortunately, Obi-Wan can't see this, or won't acknowledge it. Considering the controlling circumstances of their relationship, I often wondered how much Anakin told Obi-Wan about his mother. Does Obi-Wan know she was a slave, or is a slave? I would find it very abhorrent if the Jedi knew that she was a slave and allowed a mother of one of their Padawans to remain in bondage. To do so would be pretty cold and would make the Jedi pretty heartless and irredeemable. I try to believe that Anakin kept such personal things to himself, but I could be wrong. It is also evident that Obi-Wan likes to lecture Anakin on things beyond the Jedi. Listen closely to this clip as Obi-Wan starts lecturing Anakin about politics. Anakin pleads for Obi-Wan to not pursue another lecture, but it doesn't work. After a cutscene, Anakin is still arguing with him and defending Palpatine from generalizations. And there are no means scared of forgetting the niceties of democracy in order to get those bonds. Not another lecture. At least not on the economics and politics. And besides, you're generalizing. The Chancellor doesn't appear to be corrupt. I could just go on and on about this dysfunctional relationship, but let's get back to the narration of the movie. So Palpatine needs Padme dead, but he doesn't want to do it himself. So he asks Count Dooku to go kill Padme, but Count Dooku doesn't want to do it himself. So Count Dooku asks Jango Fett to go kill Padme, but Jango Fett doesn't want to do it himself. So he asks his shapeshifter friend to go kill Padme, but the shapeshifter sends a robot to go kill Padme. And if you really want to be an asshole and get even more granular, the droid says, I'll send these little bugs to go kill Padme. Palpatine sends a man who sends a man who sends a shapeshifter who sends a robot who sends bugs to go kill Padme. And what's even funnier is that after they chase the robot and the shapeshifter, Django has a chance to go kill Padme. But instead, he goes out of his way to assassinate the person he hired to assassinate Padme. That don't make no sense. If I was to kill a high-profile person, I would want to cover my tracks any way I could. That includes taking out anyone involved in the assassination. The real mistake from Django was using a Kamino Saber Dark, which is specific to a planet. This should be the real argument. Even though the information was not in the Jedi Archives, I'm positive somewhere, anywhere else would have information on the planet Kamino. I remember that, I mean, this droid opens up the window and slips these little worms in here. It has this little, this tube. It's holding the worms, but I'm like, can't you just have something like a grenade in there? Open the window and thum, boom, dead. A blaster, a laser, shoot an M80 at her head. As far as the assassination methods go, I don't mind it. I didn't mind this when they did this in previous James Bond films. Why should I mind it here? Would it have been smarter for the droid to drop a bomb or laser pad me? Sure. Or what if R2 didn't cycle off when protecting Padme? There should have been something constantly on to protect her with sensors. Then Obi-Wan goes against his own advice. Patience. Use the force. Think. And then recklessly throws himself out the window at the probe droid. Now a couple of things here he didn't know. A. He didn't know if he could catch the robot in time before falling to his death. B. If the probe could even support his weight. C. That the probe was not also a small bomb that would have exploded when he grabbed it. 
As far as Obi-Wan jumping out the window, I actually believed it because he is a hypocrite. Obi-Wan will be brash in the future as he was in the past. Like Anakin, he will lose his lightsaber not once, but twice in this film. I could even go further and mention Duchess Satine from the Clone Wars if you want to get canon deep. Obi-Wan's disrespectful attitude towards Qui-Gon mirrors the exact relationship he has with Anakin. Like George Lucas said, It's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. I think it makes perfect sense that Obi-Wan jumped out the window. I think the only argument that should be made here is why didn't Obi-Wan get cut up jumping out of the window? As for Obi-Wan not knowing about the ASN-121 assassin droid, we don't know what he knows. Is it possible during his classroom training as a youngling or Padawan that these guardians of the galaxy would learn about dangerous droids and seedy equipment used by undesirables in the galaxy that they would have to defend? That would seem a logical thing to train a Jedi if they are going to be peacekeepers. It's really not fair to assume he just doesn't know. Nor will I assume that he does. If I was an assassin, I would have made sure that the droid had a self-destruct, so I agree with Plinkett on that point. I would at least have programmed the droid to go the other way to mislead parties following or holding on to the droid, rather than coming anywhere near me. But that's not what the movie does, so let's move on. Whether it's his instinct or the force, Anakin finds Obi-Wan easily, and upon landing, the two have some fun banter. However, this turns negative real quick when Obi-Wan changes the mood by patronizing Anakin about his lightsaber skills. You spent as much time practicing your saber techniques as you your wit you would rival Master Yoda as a swordsman. I thought I already did. Only in your mind, my better young apprentice. On a side note, I always wondered why people didn't fall out of the speeders when they flew crazily through Coruscant. After an easy search, I learned that the seats actually had mini tractor beams that pulled people into the seats, and there were something called inertial compensators, much like inertial dampers on Star Trek. It's just a fun insight, nothing more, so let's go on to the next thing. On a personal note, there were always two moments during the chase that made my ears stand at attention. Maybe it's nothing, maybe it's something, but listen to the clips closely. Those sound an awful lot like this. Is that sound Slave 1 shadowing the chase on Coruscant? Or is it just a convenience? I've always wondered about that. Listen to them side by side. Okay, so during the scene where Zam dives her speeder and Anakin follows, have a sharp eye and a good quality TV ready because there is a hidden secret. If you look to the left side of the screen at this moment, you will see three TIE Fighters flying across the screen. This is verified by Lucas and John Knoll in the commentary for the film. It's really hard to see, but they are there. Now we come to the scene where Obi-Wan lectures Anakin on losing his lightsaber, and I have already covered elements of this. What I didn't cover was that there is extra dialogue to this scene. I'm sure they cut this because they already established how harsh Obi-Wan is on Anakin. I guess him saying this before you'll be the death of me was a bit too much. I've heard this lesson before. You haven't learned anything, Anakin. I try, Master. Why do I get the feeling you're going to be the death of me? Don't say that, Master. An interesting Easter egg in this bar is Ahmed Best and Anthony Daniels. They play two con men named Ahmed Beck and Daniel Faitoni, who just got a hold of some Republic security uniforms and pretend to be in the profession while searching for victims to get credits from. In the bar, Ahmed is working on two women as marks when Anakin walks by. 
Anakin's senses are so strong that he realizes something is up, and with a simple gesture, he pulls the attention of the women away from Beck. Beck is clearly agitated by this. It's a pretty neat scene and a nice touch. Daniel's character is right next to Obi-Wan at the bar. The best time to see him is after Obi-Wan cuts off Sam's hand and he turns to see what's going on. So anyway, they catch the assassin and they find out that she is a shapeshifter. Now, this is just screenwriting 101, but why is she a shapeshifter? What does this actually bring to the plot of this story? Does she at any point shapeshift in this movie to affect the story? Nope. This is a very dumb approach to this subject because Zam may be a shapeshifter but her clothes do not change form and she can be identified by those clothes because the men chasing her saw her in them. In Star Wars there are a ton of characters with tons of abilities and backstories that we never see. Why should Zam be any different? We don't see Boshek smuggling or the brain sucking Danic Jericho killing people and eating their brains. Nor do we see the Gansman Zuckus using his famous tracking abilities. It's nice that George added a layer to this bounty hunter and such details should be appreciated, not shunned. The real debate should be the motivation of this character, not what species she is. My confusion is why didn't she run in the restroom, strip naked, and become an alien that didn't wear clothes? Any of these species would do, and if she had a problem turning into something larger, or with fur, she could still morph into a scantily clad Tweelik with underwear and a bra, as they are known to dress like this in public. I have a hard time understanding why she wouldn't have done that. I definitely did not understand why she did not go for the door when the Jedi had their backs to it, and I find it incredulous that she went for Obi-Wan, even with Anakin still in the room. She chose a no-win scenario there. An interesting tidbit is that in the GameCube Bounty Hunter game, she is established to have 10 years of experience because she met Jango when he met Dooku. In the end, there is nothing wrong with her being what she was, just that it wasn't made more interesting, which really wasn't necessary for the film. After speaking to the council, Anakin speaks to Palps, and it's really a good scene. Finally seeing someone actually talk to Anakin and treating him with respect shows how easy it became for Anakin to be loyal to him. Obviously, he shares everything with Palpatine and keeps secrets from the Jedi. It wasn't the first time, Anakin. Remember what you told me about your mother? And the sand people. So I have no doubt Sheev knew that Anakin was head over heels for Padme. I am sure this is why he suggested Obi-Wan to protect Padme. When Revenge of the Sith came out, it wasn't hard for me to believe that he would turn on the Jedi. To counter this scene, I also appreciate that Yoda acknowledges the arrogance of the Jedi being a problem, though we see nothing done about this after the fact. Now the biggest complaint about this movie is the romance and the dialogue that goes with it. I will address this and I agree with a lot of it. However, I'm going to cover this after Amidala and Anakin are on Naboo during their romantic getaways. I have already talked about the desperate conversations Anakin had making her uncomfortable and I will say his stare is pretty creepy after she says she is uncomfortable. Amidala acts as I would expect her to so far. She states her boundaries and is supportive to Anakin and treats him with respect. After micromanaging Anakin one more time in front of others... Anakin, don't do anything without first consulting either myself or the Council. Yes, Master. Anakin and Padme head off world. A valid point I didn't think about for some time was if Anakin was in disguise, why did he not cut his Padawan braid? I don't have a response to this as it is valid. I've seen some wacky hairstyles in Star Wars, but I haven't seen many with apprentice braids. Now we come to multiple deleted scenes and the first is Obi-Wan researching the Kamino Saber Dart with research droids. This was an unnecessary scene to be sure, as I like him going straight to Dexter to figure out things. 
I do like that they plan to have Obi-Wan investigate more to find out where it was from, though. An interesting note is that in January 2003, Hasbro released the droids from this deleted scene, which means it was a late cut from the film. All in all, the scene is fine, but the movie flows better without it. The next deleted scene has Anakin waken from a nightmare by Padme. He states he's starting to forget his mother, and he's worried about her. I feel that any deleted scene with these two would have helped the romance of this movie because their relationship turn feels so unnatural and forced, and we really need connecting elements. And now we come to Dexter's Diner. No one will remember Dexter Jetster and his 50s cafe. Except just me, I guess. I love aliens in Star Wars, and Dex felt like a Star Wars character. He looked rugged, lived in, and, well, without grace. I also thought the figure of this character was one of the few good ones when Attack of the Clones hit theaters. I suppose this is a subjective point from a fanboy, so let's just move on. Anyways, the next deleted scene was a critical one, and I think it was a terrible mistake to leave it out. I know many people have issues with constant exposition, and I do too, but this film lacks a lot of necessary key information. One of them is Count Dooku. When Obi-Wan arrives at the Jedi Library, he talks with Jocasta Nu about the Lost 20. In the history of the Jedi, 20 have left according to the film. She tells Obi-Wan that Dooku left the Jedi about the time Qui-Gon died, and he was an individual thinker much like his student. He lost faith in the Republic. Out of the blue, he showed up as the head of the Separatist movement. This did not add a lot of information, but it did give something about Dooku, and this film needed it. Obi-Wan continues to show Jocasta that he is looking for the planet Kamino, and the librarian responds exactly how one would expect a Jedi of this era to answer. Impossible. Perhaps the archives are incomplete. If an item does not appear in our records, it does not exist. On the freighter, we have perhaps the best scene with Anakin and Padme in this film. You can sincerely believe in Anakin's infatuation, and he shows charm in this moment. Being an honest individual means that Anakin is completely open to his feelings and he wants to express them. It is pure, like the child we knew in Phantom Menace. As cringy as some may think that the Are You an Angel line is, it rings true to this scene. Padme remains cautious as we would expect and so far their relationship makes sense. It's about to change a bit though, but I'll get to that. When Padme and Anakin's transport arrive at Naboo, look to the left of the screen. You will see two YT model freighters parked. The Millennium Falcon was the same class as these ships. Our next extended scene has Anakin and Padme arriving on Naboo. This discussion would have been useful to explore their relationship as Annie talks about his love for Naboo and how he's missed it, and Padme opens up some about her personal experiences. I'm a bit torn whether these scenes should have remained in their long form. In the released version, a nice touch is showing R2 go upstairs, though. As Obi-Wan leaves the planet, there was an alternate scene with Mace Windu that was cut. It had Mace walking Obi-Wan to his ship, and he voiced concerns about Anakin. They replaced this scene with Yoda talking about arrogance in the Jedi later in the production. However, this was a needed moment for Windu because he is so intolerant towards Anakin throughout the entire trilogy. And this was the only time he let up and said, Obi-Wan, you must have faith that he will choose the right path. Yes, Master. This would have been a nice sight of humanity to see on Mace Windu. I think this scene is better than its replacement in the film because it mentions concerns that Anakin was too old to start training and that Obi-Wan worries that Anakin is confused because of Padme. This scene has a lot discussed in it and the only thing the new scene adds is that Yoda says many of the Jedi are arrogant. 
This next scene is where the relationship between Anakin and Padme started to show signs of trouble. In the meantime, we must consider your own safety. What is your suggestion, Master Jedi? Oh, Anakin's not a Jedi yet. He's still a Padawan learner. Anakin gets defensive really quick, rightfully so. This makes sense for him specifically because that's about all he knows according to what episode 1 and 2 shows us since he left Tatooine. Padme shows polite agitation and Anakin relents. It is evident it is forced and not really sincere. Padme's expression is appropriate and both should be pretty pissed at each other. I think at this point she of all people would realize that hooking up with this guy would be a roller coaster emotionally. Anakin should also start to realize that she is not the faultless image he imagined all those years. At the very least the pedestal she is on should be a bit smaller. In the upcoming scenes it is as if this scene never happened and that is when the verisimilitude of this relationship begins to falter. Having a scene where they both apologize for this instance would have gone a long way to cement a relationship, but it never happens, and it really hurts the believability of their love. And this is just one domino of many coming. And with that, we're at the end of part one. We'll see you in part two. If I'm not back in five minutes, just wait longer. If you like what you saw here, Click like and subscribe.